Okay. Well, good morning. Today I have the honor of introducing our grand round speaker, Dr. Richard Vo, one of our beloved third year residents. Dr. Vo comes to us originally from Texas. In 2007, Richard achieved his Bachelor of Science degree in biology, cum laude, at the Texas Southern University in Houston. This was followed by two years attending the Dallas Baptist University in Dallas, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Christian Studies, also cum laude. In 2009, Richard matriculated at the University of Texas Branch School of Medicine in Galveston. During his years at medical school, Richard served as a campus tour guide, volunteered at a local homeless shelter, crunched research data for the University of Arizona, worked in an HIV and family planning clinic in Kenya, and developed medical missions to Lima, Peru, and to Laredo, Texas, and he served as an officer in the Christian Medical Association in Galveston. In 2010, Richard received a Global Health Scholarship. In May of 2013, Richard obtained his medical degree and shortly thereafter joined the Pediatrics Residency Program at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Between medical school and residency during both times at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, Dr. Vo was co-author of seven peer-reviewed research publications. In 2014, Dr. Vo, questioning whether he really, really wanted to be a pediatrician, resigned from his residency. During the year that followed, Richard traveled internationally, learned carpentry, volunteered at a summer camp, and he participated in childhood asthma research at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. After considerable reflection, Dr. Vo decided to restart his career in pediatrics and apply to our res residency program here at Sanford. In the time that Dr. Vo has been with us since 2016, he has established himself as an academician and as an advocate for children and for physician wellness. He is actively involved in bench research with Dr. Jessica White on the microbiome of the preterm infant gut. And in, this is an endeavor that has resulted in two regional research society poster presentations. In addition, he received a grant to establish a parent navigator QI project for the general pediatrics outpatient clinics. Other activities include participating in the neonatal reference QI project, representing the Sanford Children's Residency Program at, as an American Academy of Pediatrics University of South Dakota delegate at the 2016 AAP National Conference and Exhibition, and as the South Dakota resident representative at the 2018 AAP Legislative Conference. He has also helped develop the Residency Wellness Committee, of which he is an active member, and he was instrumental, along with Drs. Michelle Schimmelfennig and Molly Lynn, in obtaining the AAP 2018-2019 Leonard P. Rome Catch Visiting Professorship Grant that will be used for a two-day faculty and resident workshop to spearhead advocacy for children in the state of South Dakota. Dr. Vo is also a clinical instructor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of South Dakota Sanford School of Medicine. In his residency application to Sanford Children's, Richard wrote, absence makes the heart grow fonder. This statement aptly describes my relationship with medical training a relationship that has tested, broken, and matured me. I miss the practice of medicine. To succeed, I need to leave behind my pride and insecurities and enter the world of what it means to be a healthcare provider. All of us at Children's are certainly glad Dr. Vo joined our team at Sanford Children's. He has challenged us to be good physicians, thoughtful physicians, and well physicians. Please welcome Dr. Vo, who's going to talk about <laughs> pediatric perspective. Thanks, Dr. Zell. Wow, that was long. Um, so, you know, about four times a year we meet with Dr. Zell, and we talk about what our future career plans are. And, you know, at one point, and still could be a possibility, I thought about doing neonatology. That's still on the radar, but then 
we also talked about my own interests, and one of them being mental health. And, and Dr. Zettel said, you don't make any sense. You want to do NICU, but you're also really interested in this part of medicine, which has nothing to do with NICU. And part of the reason why is that because it matters. Mental health does matter, especially for children. And we'll talk about it why as we go through these slides. So I'd like, like to start with this quote from Frederick Douglass. Um, it is easier to build strong children than repair broken men. And everyone here has dealt with children or parents or families that have some sort of mental health issue, um, whether with patients or personally. Um, and honestly, for me, this came from something that I was really interested in to something that was really personal for me, at least this past December. So this past December, I had a, a great friend of mine commit suicide. He um, went into his garage, pulled out his wife's gun, and shot himself in the head. Um, and it really makes you think, you know, about what is life and all those existential crisis questions of life when one of your closest friends does that to themselves. And, you know, fortunately, Dr. Zendel and the program was super supportive as I went down to Kentucky and attended his wake and spoke to his wife, spoke to his friends, whom some of them I knew well and some of them I didn't. But when we looked at his life, his life really represents that of a broken man, of someone who grew up in a home that was very toxic. And he was able to get out, get out of that, go to college, be successful, make really good money, marry a beautiful woman, and yet, none of that all mattered. Um, so yeah, let's talk. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, I apologize for anything offensive I may say, because we all know I put my phone in my mouth sometimes. And also, there is one graphic image at the end that I'll share with you guys. So the outline of my, my presentation, we'll talk about the current state of mental health. We'll talk a little bit about early brain and childhood development. We'll talk about the role of the pediatrician and the role of the village. So November of this past year, the director of CDC came out with a statement on life expectancy, saying, the latest CDC data shows that the US life expectancy has declined over the past few years. Tragically, this troubling trend is largely driven by deaths from drug overdose and suicide. Life expectancy gives us a snapshot of the nation's overall health. And these sober statistics are a wake up call that we're losing too many Americans too early, too, too often, to conditions that are preventable. Robert R. Redfield, MD, CDC director. And it's interesting because, so yesterday, I was um, in the cath lab with Dr. Bendeley and talking to a family afterwards about the successful procedure we had. And the family just marveled about technology and how technology has some, come so far and how it's so amazing. And I just think about America, the United States of America, and we're arguably the most technologically advanced country in the world. Yet, people are living less as, less as long as they have over the past three years. And so this trend over the past few, few years has taken our national life expectancy from 43rd worldwide to 64th worldwide. Um, and if you think about the trend over the past few years, the last time we saw such trend was over 100 years ago, when none of us were born and most of our grandparents weren't born because it was World War I and the combination of that and the influenza pandemic. So this is a paper that came, about, came out this past summer on hospitalizations for children who endure suicide ideation or suicide attempts. The study looked at 31 children's hospitals. It looked at over 100,000 encounters for this incident. And so as you can see up here, this is, where's my mouse? Great. Um, so this is a trend of encounters over time. So the top, at the top you have your 15 to 17 year olds. The middle you have your 12 to 14 year olds. At the bottom you have your 5 to 11 year olds. And you see the peaks and valleys are associated with um, the time of the year. So you can imagine if it's summertime, suicide's going to be down. And as school starts, suicide increases a little bit. And then over the winter period of time, suicide gets even worse. And then as spring enters school and summer enters, it gets better. And so if you just draw a line to make it a little bit easier to see, you see just the drastic changes over a period of just seven years 
of how many children are um, endorses they want to hurt themselves or are hurting themselves. And in fact, the trend is about a 292% increase over just a seven year period of time. So what about deaths? So this is looking at um, the CDC um, statistics on, on deaths um, in 2017. So on the left hand corner, you have the rank between one and five. And then on the top, you have the ages between five and 24. And in the green, you have your suicide. And so between 2016 and 2017, for 15 and 24 year olds, the increase was about 10%, or just under. And then for 10 to 14 year olds, the increase was almost 20%. And if you actually take a look specifically at what the blue box is, it's an intentional injury. And if you look exactly what it is, it includes you know, motor vehicle accidents, includes unintentional drownings, etc. And in fact, if you look at that column and break it down, the highest number of deaths from that category is motor vehicle accidents, which only accounts for about 400 deaths per year in the 10 to 14 year olds. So suicide is actually the number one leading cause for deaths in that age group. So what about South Dakota? Because we live in South Dakota and we care about South Dakota, which is why we're here. So in the far left, you can see where South Dakota is. We're, we're at about 8.4 rates of children's deaths per year, or per 100,000 individuals per year. And I put up the other states for all the states that are surrounding South Dakota. And, you know, you were to go, I don't know, 30 miles east of us, Minnesota, the death rates easily in half. And if you actually look at the national average, the national average is only about three deaths per 100,000 individuals. And so, Unfortunately, we're at the top of that list for, for the states, for South Dakota and the states surrounding us. And nationally, we're the second highest. The only other state that has a higher rate than us is Alaska. And it, it's really sad because we think of South Dakota as a great place to raise our families and whatnot. But if you have a child who lives in South Dakota, your child's three times more likely than a natural average child to kill themselves. So the question is why? Why are children killing themselves more so now than they have ever been? So stressors. It's much harder to be a child in today's society than it was when I was a child, that's for sure. I mean, for example, you take a look at bullying and how that's just increased, has increased over a period of time. Social media has played a huge part of that. And then the resilience of support that children get as they're raised is not adequate. And we'll talk more about the support as we continue through my power presentation. So if we take a step back for a second and think about what is mental wellness and what does mental wellness entail, mental wellness is not just the absence of disease, right? It's so much more than that. So we start with basic cognitive capacity, the ability to know between right and wrong. Talk about an ability to sustain attention so basically being able to learn and mature over a period of time, but which requires the ability to pay attention to what's going on around you. A positive self-esteem, which is pretty obvious, but if you think about it, having a positive self-esteem as a teenager is incredibly hard, or even an adult, given what's going around you and all the factors that play into your life that can contribute to a poor self-esteem. And so basically that's resilience is what we're talking about. Ability to form social bonds. So this has nothing to do with introvert, extrovert. It's the ability to just connect with a person on a basic level and have a conversation and have a meaningful engagement with one another. And then reasonable ability to regulate mood and behavior. So I like thinking about those, the people that we know that are very reactive. Whether they react out of anxiety, they react out of anger, and they can't control those feelings that they have inside themselves. And if you think about it, it's, a parent who maybe abuses a spouse or a child, they may not be a bad person, they just can't control those fears inside of them and make bad decisions. All of which the foundations start in early childhood. So if we look at early childhood development potential, so the blue line is the brain's ability to um, respond to changes over time based off their experiences. And the pur or purple, orange line is the amount of effort it requires to induce that change. 
So you think about a child early on who can learn languages or just take up all that information. And then you think about your grandparents or the older people in our lives who have a hard time learning new things. And so when you think about it, early on, we have the potential to, um, to impact children in a very positive way or in a very negative way. And as they get older, our chances of influencing them, whether positive or negative, do decrease. But really, those early years are the years that really matter. To help us understand what's going on in the brain, this is a slide looking at synaptogenesis, so or creation of synapses. And what synapses function as are basically, they help our brain neurons communicate with one another. And we know, we know that synapses play a large role in our development as humans. And so, as you can see, this is starting at three months of age and looking at 16 months of age. And you can really see from three months to two or three years, there's obvious changes. And if you look closely enough, you can see changes from four to five years. And we know from science that synaptogenesis doesn't end at five years. It does continue on. But really, those first five years of life are the, are, are the years that we're talking about where these synapses are being most created. So then what areas of the brain are affected? So this is a study looked at children 0 to 5 and um, stresses in their life, and 10 years later, how it impacted their brain. And specifically, it looked at gray matter development. And so the two areas of the brain they talked about first are the, is the amygdala. So the amygdala, I like to think about, is our gas pedal. It's what controls our impulsivity and emotions. Um, and then you have the prefrontal cortex, which is what you think about with your ADHD kids. And it's the brain that tells them, hey, don't act on that impulse, or make good judgment, or make good decisions. Those are the two main areas of the brain um, that are affected in regards to brain matter development in children. So from, from a financial standpoint, I thought it was very interesting. So there is a Nobel Prize winner called James Heckman. He's, he's out of the University of Chicago. And he looked at the um, economic relationship of social, early social development programs and how they um, financially impacted um, our population as they get older. And as you can see, <clears throat> over time, the most influential programs are the ones that start early on in life, as we can see, <clears throat> excuse me, and as you get older, they're less and less influential. And through his brilliant calculations, which I didn't quite understand myself, um, he concluded that you can have up to 13% interest per year return on your investment. Now, for those of us who, who look at our retirement accounts on a, a relatively regular basis, you can only imagine what a 13% return on interest is per year. It's something you, it's really unheard of. Um, and obviously, we don't see that in income for children, but you do see that in money saved over time. So why is this important? Well, basically, early childhood development plays into the social, emotional, behavioral, and intellectual. And then really, what we're talking about is the first 1,000 years, or 1,000 years, 1,000 days of life. Um, and it's so important that there are at least two advocacy organizations that have dedicated themselves to educating people nationally and worldwide on why it's important and how they can improve the lives of children early on. So pivoting a little bit, we'll go to talk about what are the obstacles to childhood mental health care. So the obvious one is we just don't have enough providers to address those issues, at least specialized providers. There's also the idea of we don't, we don't adequately screen for prevention. So when you think about well child checks, we do, we do some screening early on in life. And then we don't really screen for mental health issues until 12 years of life. At least that's what we do here. And I think we actually do better than other places. If you think about it, you've got about 10 years of life where no one's screening them from a formal setting on how the child is doing um, from a behavioral, emotional standpoint. We do ask them questions of how they're doing, how they think their child is um, behaving at home and school. And if they give us a negative response, we'll address it. But if you think about it, 
And then when you look at what the studies I've shown, when you take an experienced pediatrician and have them evaluate a child, about 50% of the time they're unable to detect that there is some sort of emotional behavioral problem going on with that child. Another sad thing is that about 44% of pediatricians, pediatricians are not interested in managing mental health problems. Part of that is expectations. I don't think many pediatricians expected to enter into pediatrics managing those problems, but unfortunately that's what primary care pediatrics is in, in many ways. But there's also the fact that it's very time consuming. You have to deal with the stigmatization of mental health, which is just, which is in today's society incredibly hard to overcome. And there's also the fact that pediatricians are not inadequately trained. And there is some bias in this data because it's mostly looking at young graduates. And part of the bias is that, you know, for myself, I'm about to graduate in four months, and I'm slightly terrified, or really terrified, let's be honest. And part of that is just a self-doubt self of not having that support that we have here as residents, and that's someone we can call to to support us in our decisions. But really, it's a bigger issue than that, which leads us to the resi resident education dilemma. So in 1978, the Future Pediatrics Task Force called residency programs to provide more training in behavioral, developmental, and adolescent issues. About 20 years later, the second rendition of this task force called for extra training in children's mental health must be provided. 10 years later, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a policy statement and said, we need to improve our behavioral health training. You get the idea. Every few years, there's a new statement saying, we need to improve how we train pediatricians' behavioral health. And this is a problem nationwide. The real question is, is better training enough? <laughs> if we were able to adequately train all pediatricians to address all those issues, is that actually enough? So about five years ago, um, a paper came out out of pediatrics titled, Does Well Child Care Have a Future in Pediatrics? And they basically argued that well child checks in its current form do not do a great job of addressing um, or pre preventing chronic diseases of adulthood, such as mental health. And the reason is that, is that they don't adequately address poverty, they don't adequately address poor edu education outcomes, unhealthy social and physical environments, or unhealthy lifestyles. And basically the authors are saying that, no, we don't think we should abolish flow child checks. There, there's a lot of value in how they, what they do. But maybe we should upgrade them to meet the needs of current day, our current day population. And so a simple analogy is, you have a family of five, you're driving a Toyota Camry. Super reliable car. Great gas mileage, doesn't break down. You have a six child, right? Obviously, that car only takes five people. You have, therefore, you have to upgrade to that beloved minivan that all of us would want to drive. And that's just the no-brainer, because that's the need. You need another seat for your child. Other, otherwise, you might be called by CPS by Dr. Hagar, because you don't have room in your car for your child. And so the question is really, actually going back, is, or part of the question is, is this the role of the pediatrician to help prevent chronic diseases of adulthood? Or is it our role to address poverty or any of these other issues? And so I fall back to our primary care Bible. So Bright Features is something created by AAP. And it helps guide pediatricians in how we should address the health maintenance needs of children. And so we're on our current our fourth edition of it. Um, and so in the, the fourth edition, one of the things they emphasize is that children's health must be viewed in its broadest context with attention to environmental factors, psychosocial factors, and social determinants of health. That looks a lot like that blue box I put up there that was in the other slide. And really what they're talking about is when pediatrics was first created as a field, it was primarily to address transmittable diseases of childhood. With the advent of technology, and gratefully so, we now have vaccinations. And it's, so the pendulum has swung from transmittable diseases now to prevention, education, and some behavioral health, intermixed with, yes, we do see sick kids. 
and we also manage chronic illnesses as well of childhood. But we have to look at children's health from a much broader perspective and all the external factors that play into a child's health. And so, Bright Futures puts out, has 12 different promotions they talk about. I'm not going to talk about all 12 of them, but I will talk about some. So, promoting family support. So there's a swing towards a two-generation approach to how we take care of children. Because if we think about good parental health equals good child health. And if a parent has all the needs that they have, therefore they're able to adequately provide for the needs of their child. One of the new ones for this past edition is promoting lifelong health for families and communities. And so a lot of what we do is address issues that parents have or concerns they have, which are a lot of them are childhood issues. But really, we must think past childhood into adulthood. And what are the tools or what are the aspects of a child health that, um, that affect lifelong development? So for example, early childhood development. How can we support, better support families in this crucial years, this crucial first five years of life? Um, one, another new one they talked about is promoting health, healthy and safe use of social media. As we're all well aware, social media probably has influence on in all of our mental health. Whether we have FOMO or fear of missing out, and when we see people go on vacations and realize, man, I'm on call right now while my friends who are not on call are out on vacation. But really, it's as a pediatrician talking to families about what are good uses of social media and more so what are the negative uses of social media and how do they play into your child's well-being. And then obviously mental health. And so basically what the authors of that paper were talk would ascribe to is creating a multidisciplinary team to be a part of essentially every well visit. And so we're looking at our social workers who are there to help provide for whether it's um, monetary needs, whether it's transportation needs, whether it's um, they just need to figure out how to get out of debt and maybe point them in the correct direction of resources that are out in the community that they can um, enlist help from. Our dietitians. So pediatricians, I think we're pretty solid at addressing dietary needs. But given our time, we generally only address them if they become, they're an issue, or there's concerns that the child is only eating pizza and drinking soda. But we really don't have the time to really sit down with family and talk about what is a healthy meal, how's it take to, what does it take to make a healthy meal, and do you have the money to go out and buy the ingredients for a healthy meal? Development. So we're, I think we're also very good with development, and we understand what plays into a child development as it progresses through life. But having someone there to, to really sit with the family and talk about, hey, these are ways that you can really support your child in this early, early years of life. And here, this is what it looks like for a child to go from middle school to being a teenager and all the emotions and all the behaviors that come with that. And then how can we address them if they come up, which is where your behavioral specialist comes in. And even more so, there are just some behaviors that are questionably um, of concern how can we nip those in the bud so that they don't become an issue later? And then we have our physician who, wait, what do they do again? No, just kidding. Really, physicians are very important, but at the same time, in some ways, we can do all those things that a social worker and dietitian developmental expert and behavioral specialist can do. But unfortunately, we just don't have the time to sit there for what is likely to be at least an hour or more conversation with the family which is why we need a team approach to it. So an analogy I like to use is a surgical team. So if you need your appendix out, you have a team of people. You have your surgeon, you have your anesthesiologist, you have your OR nurse, you have your surgical tech. Now imagine if the surgeon walks in and said, well, I'm just gonna be doing your surgery today. No one would be okay with that. You would probably run out the door and scream for help. And so therefore, why are we okay with a single pediatrician doing all the um, parts of what, the, of what other people can do? And why, as, a, as pediatricians, are we okay in letting ourselves be abused in that, in that form when we can have other people to help us really adequately address the behavioral needs of children or their overall well-being? 
So who should be responsible for mental health crisis or mental wellness, so to speak? Parents and families. Parents are the, the easiest targets possible when it comes to a child who's acting out or a child who makes poor decisions. And in some ways it makes sense because parents and families are the single most important factor in a child's wellness. But when you think about families in today's society, unfortunately, about one third of children currently live in single parent homes. Not to say that there are not tons of single parent uh, families that do such a great job. But if you think about it, you've taken it, a job that requires two people, because it takes two to make a child, right? And you've basically put all the responsibility on one person. Because, and a lot of cases, there is good um, co-parenting between two separate parents. But also, you have parents who use their kid as leverage and as um, power to hurt one another, which obviously doesn't play well into the child's well-being. What about teachers or the education system? So teachers, unfortunately, have had to some degree take over parenting for parents. And unfortunately, that's played into some of their burnout as well. They're, all, they're also not well supported. They're underpaid. In the spite that they spend arguably more time with our children in the early years of life than we do, and are a huge influence into um, who they become. And then you look at the education system. Schooling is great, free schooling is even better. But our current education system is more interested in standardized testing, which is important. You know, knowledge is important to, to succeed in life. But there are so many different aspects of a child that play into their success in life than their intelligence or their knowledge. So physicians and their healthcare system. So I've already talked about pediatricians, so we won't go into that, other than the fact that all doctors to some degree are burnt out. Um, but with our healthcare system, so you have a healthcare system who's really a business, right? And, they're a bit, and as a business, you have to make money, which is part of why you know, there's that swing from doctors running hospitals and clinics to bring in administrators and people with MBAs to help run hospitals because we're just not good at finances and we don't know how to make things profitable and sustainable. So we brought people in to help us. Fortunately or unfortunately, they've been able to do that and make hospital systems profitable to some, profitable to some degree. But what they've also, but with administrators, they also don't quite know what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis and what physicians, nurses, social workers, and they are essentially on the front lines and sometimes miss out on what the big picture is because they don't see children on a daily basis. Politicians, well, I won't comment on that too much, although I do think politicians do have the best of intentions. Unfortunately, they can't get out of their own way sometimes. And then our government, which, the thing about it, government actually has a lot of great programs, great money, resources that they do provide um, communities. But really, we're not going to depend on the government alone for the well-being of our children. So the answer is everybody. We're all responsible for this. So the, here's a quote that some of us or all of us have heard at some point of our lives. It takes a village to raise a child. And as we all know, villages no longer exist because villages used to be this natural occurrence of people who gathered around together to basically support one another, to give and receive support, whether it's family, whether it's neighbors, whether it's just other people in the community. And it's really about the village and the village's prosperity. Um, and so those don't exist anymore, but a new um, terminology, so to speak, that's been brought up is the modern village, which I know is very original, but it gets a point across. So what is a modern village? So we're looking at a modern village, we have the family, we have the child, we have the connect connection between the family that plays into the family. We have the family's mental health and we have their socioeconomic status. So point that family is what we like to call informal social capital. So we have our extended family, we have our friends, we have our neighbors, we have a religion and culture that helps support the family, and the housing, the education, and um, our jobs play into the social network status of the family. And then outside of that, you have your formal social capital, which essentially we think about as government, 
government or other institutions that help support um, families in a large way. So you have your pediatricians, your medical home, your early intervention services like birth to three, your home visit programs, social services, schools, teachers, child care, transportation, etc. And so, you know, if you take a look at it all together, this is essentially what your modern village is, at least on paper. Keyword paper. And so obviously they all exist. We can all go online and Google any of these services and we can find it and it exists out there in some form. But if you really think about it, does a modern village actually exist? And to further explore that, you have to think about the role of the modern village. So at the center of a village, you have the child, so to speak. The child is the center of the world. Center of the world. And then you have the family who is there to support the child, right? And then you have the village or other, other families and other community members who not only support the child, but also support the family and supporting the child. And I would argue that the village does not exist, at least exists in a very effective form. And a simple argument for me is, is if children were adequately supported by this so-called modern village, they wouldn't be killing themselves at such a fast rate as we see today. Another example is measuring parental wellness. So this is a study done about three years ago looking at parental wellness. And what they did was they looked at essentially parental happiness for, the, for two years after specific life events. And so those life events are divorce, unemployment, death of a partner, and birth of a first child. So I fortunately have never encountered any of those aspects in my life because, well, my wife is here. And if I really think about it, if my wife were to die, and for those of you who know me, I would literally melt. I would melt like the witch from Wizard of Oz, and I would just be destroyed. And so if you were to tell me that having your first child plays more negatively into my happiness than my wife dying, I'm going to tell you I'm never having children. And in fact, we do have a five-year plan that every five years, or every year, I say five more years, we'll have kids. <laughs> And it's not just because of the study, but it's also because I'm terrified of being a parent. And I'm also still a child, and so I don't want to give that up. <laughs> um, but part of it actually does make sense. Maybe it's not that extreme a degree, but it makes sense why parents are unhappy. And you think about it, I have friends, we have friends, and people tell us having a child, or depending on who you talk to, is a beautiful thing. It's a great thing. It's such a great feeling having that child sit on, sit on top of you or lay on top of you, do tummy time. Things that, which I've not experienced, but which has been told by friends of mine. And so you're told this concept that's a beautiful thing, and then you take this child home, and you realize that, man, no one sent me home with a manual on how to raise this child. And so I just have to figure it out all on my own, with some help, probably using the internet to some degree, trying to figure out, does this match what my child is doing? And essentially, it's one large experiment every day of your life. Figuring out what's best for my child and what should I not do with my child. And so you can imagine that if parents aren't fully supported in raising their child, they're likely not going to be as happy as they should be. So why does a modern village not exist? So we have to take a look at what it takes to create a modern village. So humility. So the humility to ask for help. Because asking for help is not something that's easy for a lot of us to do. It shows weakness, which plays into vulnerability. And no one wants to show all their cards. But on the other side is the humility to accept help even when we're not asking for it. Or accept advice even when we don't want it. And unfortunately, that's something as a society we don't do well. We don't receive help or ask for help well. And I can just think you know, the example of when you offer some if you were to offer some assistance to a random person, I imagine their response would be, well, let me raise my family how I like to raise my family, and you raise your family how you raise your family. Which, I get it, it makes sense. You know, no one likes someone nosing into their business and telling them what to do. But to some degree, this is a team effort, and you're just two parents, and sometimes one parent, and you do need help regardless of who you are, because you don't have all the answers. 
there's selflessness. Selflessness to step outside of our worlds that we've created for ourselves, our oh so important worlds, um, and all of the factors in our world that we think are important, and really step out and help others in whatever way or form, whether it's bringing someone who just had a child um, some food, or, um, I mean, there's so many ways we can help people, but really I'm talking about doing it in a meaningful and very intentional and um, relational way. And, and if you think about it as parents, probably selflessness is an easy thing, but a hard thing for parents, at least in today's society, to um, exhibit. Because we, when we, as parents, you think parents are selfless towards their child, which is key. But parents also have this urge to protect their child. So strong, it's such a strong urge to protect their child. And sometimes they just have a hard time letting their child go free, to explore the world, to make mistakes. And really, they should be making mistakes, at least early on in life, where you can pick them up and support them. Rather, later on, as adults, they make mistakes. And they don't go to juvenile detention. They go to prison. The awareness. So awareness realize that Richard is right, that we do need a modern village, but also awareness that there's something wrong going on with society. And even just looking at how cruel children are to one another. I couldn't imagine kids being that cruel back in my day. And I was to some degree bullied because I was kind of awkward when I was younger. But they're just so cruel today. And there's something wrong with that. I mean, we would all agree there's something wrong with, um, with society and the cruelness of how just not just children tr treat each other, but how we treat each other. And so it's on us. When I say us, as people or as healthcare professionals and providers, and to really realize that, hey, there's something going on, and I should be a part in addressing it. Or, and so I'll talk a little bit about advocacy for a second. So advocacy, we all think about advocacy as um, going to speak to your politician and talk about whatever agenda you may have. But advocacy is really about being a voice for those who cannot speak for themselves. And it can be a voice for a friend, it can be a voice for a child, or it can be a voice for a family or community. And it can be in very small ways from a community set, communal setting or community setting or at the federal level. It doesn't matter. But all that matters is that you're willing to think about someone other than yourself, which is hard because obviously I just I like to think about myself a lot, especially when I look at myself in the mirror. Um, but that's what really calls. That's what it really requires for us to do is to step us out of our world and speak for others. Just a quick plug-in for those who are interested in advocacy. May second, May third, we are hosting an advocacy event. If you're interested, email Molly Lynn or come talk to me. And so our takeaway: investing early in childhood children is critical or crucial to de their development and how we as pediatricians or as members of the community and as families can do that better. Um, we need to improve how well child checks um, are done. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of questions or maybe no questions about money and things like that and how that plays into it and is it really beneficial? Um, but there's a need that has been shown through child suicide. And as pediatricians, we should seek a way to help support that. And the greatest avenue I can see is through World Child Jugs. Um, obviously, I've talked a bit about the modern village, but we need to be a part of that modern village. We need to help create that modern village to help support children and families. And then the mental health epidemic is real. And when I say epidemic, not just suicide, not just drug abuse, I'm talk also talking about there's that insidious epidemic that is, don't get offended, complacency. And I think to some degree, as a society, we've become complacent. Maybe not people in this room, but to some extent, we are all complacent because we're able to continue our lives day by day and basically ignore what's going around us. And hopefully, with this talk, my, my hope is that most people just weren't aware and now that they're aware, so now they can act on what they now know. Um, and so the last slide I'll show is, so this is, this is a picture that I took when I was at University of Virginia. It is not a painting. It's not a rash. 
It's a child who etched into their arm, I just want to be loved. 12-year-old girl. It's interesting, the idea of love, right? Um, it's not asking for parent love. It's not asking for a specific person to love them. It's just asking to be loved. And the thing about love is love requires no money. It just requires us being humans and how we engage with each other. And so to quote John F. Kennedy, children are the most, world's most valuable resources and its best hope for the future. And you know, when I started this presentation, my hope was to you know, change the world to some this extent. But I, I realized my hope is just to have planted some seeds in you guys, and maybe over time they'll grow, and maybe you'll want to be a part of this modern village that I've talked about. That's all, folks. Um, I guess I have to start off with taking questions from outside sites, if there are any. Going once, going twice. Dr. Blake. Jerry, hold on a second, please. Oh. <clears throat> Uh, I know that there are a lot of indicators uh, for um, poor mental health, um, and um, you talked about suicide as, as the main indicator, but uh, I think you can see um, a lot of un other indicators. For example, obesity, I think uh, a large po uh, segment of the population overeats to treat their anxiety or to treat their stress. Um, but I think uh, um, school failure is, is a pretty common thing. I think that um, um, it, if you really want to pick up um, mental problems in children, uh, you can do it through the schools, because the teachers identify those kids right away. I mean, they really stick out in a classroom. and. Um, and a lot of those kids drop out of school. And I noticed the headlines in today's Argus Leader is they're going to pass a bill that will lower the age from 18 to, to 16 that kids can legally drop out of school. Um, and so it's all kind of reflected in our society. It's like you said. Um, yeah, I think you need to look at not just the suicides, but I, that's a significant problem, especially young suicides. But you need to look at all these other factors, too, uh, as far as uh, as far as how do we assess the mental health in our community. And, and there really are communities that are very aware of that. You know, not only do they have good mental health facilities, but they have um, coordination between schools, between, uh, you know, systems, systems of care, you know, between the uh, medical system, mental health system, uh, schools, that there's a lot of coordination and those kids are picked up early and, and, and supported. And so communities can make a difference, but it would be a, it'd be a good talk just to talk about how to create a modern village. So Thank you very much, Richard. You really did. Thanks. So absolutely. I mean, when you look at the long list of what causes death, um, all of them have some degree men mental wellness into them. So you just think about you know, the parents who expect their seven-year-old child to take their daily medication. And you're when they tell you that, in your mind you're thinking, are you crazy? Why would you ever expect your seven year child to remember to take their medicine every day? And no, that's not a disease, but there's something that's not clicking in their brain that, that needs to be done, that they as a parent need to ensure that their child is taking their medicine. And it's such a small thing, but also a big thing, especially if you're talking to your endocrinologist. Um, but, and then when you think about teachers, so I've friends who are teachers, and parent teacher, when you talk about parent-teacher conferences, the only people that go to those conferences are the good parents. So the parents that have the time to care, or the parents care that don't go, but they have the time to go, and they have to care. And so fortunately, a lot of times, the communication between parent and teacher is not very strong. And so, which then, something that we're actually looking at with our advocacy grant. There's, we're going to have a panel on how do pediatricians partner up with teachers to address mental health issues. So that will be one of the panels we're actually doing on uh, May 2nd. But thanks, Dr. Boyd. Other questions for Richard? Yeah. Thinking about multiple things in your 
presentation and thinking about opportunities I, and knowing that South Dakota has a super high rate of kids in childcare. I, I feel like that's maybe a missed opportunity. You know, we're kind of skipping that and going right to the school when most of these kids are starting daycare at 12 weeks yep. of age. Did you come across any studies or models that looked at ways to integrate some of these like attentiveness, emotional regulation, those kind of things into childcare settings? To be honest, no. Um, so would you, with that said, so there's obviously Head Start, which isn't, which and pre Head Start, which is pre K, and essentially after birth to three. And so when you look at those studies, there has been some supportive evidence that things like sitting around a table at meal time instead of having all the children sit in front of a TV has can play into some of those things and eating healthy. And some of those kids take those things home and trans and move them from the, the care setting to the um, the home setting, and so there is some data that's beneficial. And then James Heckman, um, with his studies or what he looked at, a lot of those programs looked more at how kids who are going, making sure kids go to see the well child checks on a more regular basis. When I say regular, not yearly, at least after those first few years, but after three or four, they're still they're still seeing pediatricians three or four times a year, and so having constant check-ins with the medical providers, but then also partially addressing some of these social terms of health. But no, not specifically, Dr. Hager. With, yeah. And I agree, because like, with, you know, with the, the feminist, not feminist, woman re revolution, moms now get a chance to work, and which is great. They get to work. And they also get a chance to stay at home. But that's also created this new rise for child care that has swung from the 60s. And so now a lot of kids shortly after they're born within a few months are now going to daycare and play a huge role into early childhood development. Other questions or comments? Uh, hold on, Jenny. Uh, you know, taking off from Jennifer's uh, question, um, a lot of communities uh, have programs where uh, mothers, new mothers are allowed to uh, uh, stay off of work and still get paid for for a year, you know. And uh, I know in Canada, uh, if you have a brand new baby, the mother can stay at home and, and receive half their normal salary uh, through uh, unemployment insurance. And uh, and when you look at your graph about when you can really influence the mental health of, of children, it's really that first couple years, you know that you can do that. Is there any way that uh, in your advocacy uh, presentation in, in May that you could talk about that, about um, passing laws that require, um, or passing laws that require unemployment insurance to allow moms to take a year off? Sure. So we don't support moms well, or dads well in this early, um, early months or year of life. Um, and so there's actually something called the Family Act or Family Service Act that was, be, was being pushed through Congress. When I say pushed, it really died before it entered any subcommittee. But basically the idea was that we're, we're taking um, FMLA and applying it to parents. And we're, FMLA will be similar to Social Security. So you know, when we all get a paycheck, we pay some money to Social Security. And it's essentially a buy-in. You know, when you pay Social Security and then when, when you retire at wherever the new age is, you get money from Social Security. And so with this buy-in is that you create a department that's out of the administration of Social Security, and money is used from people's <coughs> paychecks. And so when parents have to take time off for their child, for child's illness or for a child's birth, they aren't, um, they're not affected with losing income, which then allows them to be able to stay at home and really impact their child. Unfortunately, we live in a society, at least the United States of America, that doesn't necessarily um, cherish that idea of not working because that's that's just America, and we, hard work is our motto, American dream. Um, and so that bill is it's been pushed through a couple of attempted to be it's been introduced a couple of times and has been has died a few times. So. Sorry, Dr. Blake. <laughs> so I was just going to add to this. When it said moms, and I agree, it's moms and dads. It's not just 
the mom <laughs> can need to take time off. There's this connection between the father and the kid that we are missing on. The other thing was we keep talking about the United the United States. We in this country in everything, not just in mental health. We feel like we, we act like we live in a bubble. It's just us, and we don't know what's going on in the world. So what's happening in other countries, like countries like developed countries that are have similar culture, and how are they doing compared to what we're doing? So what are we doing wrong compared to them, if we are? Is it this epidemic, we talk about epidemic in the United States with mental health, is it something that's happening everywhere, or it's just us? Uh, and if it's not just us, what is going on in other countries that make us worse than them? So part, part of it is us, because if you look at just with life expectancy, right, the two largest contributors to why we've been dropping is drug abuse and suicide, both of which have their roots in mental health. And so if other countries were experiencing the same degree of um, suicide and drug abuse, we wouldn't have dropped from 42 to 60 something. We would be able to stay in the same place, hypothetically. And so, to some extent, to answer your question, you know, other countries aren't quite experiencing that, and I don't have the exact answer to why that is. I'm not going to say, you know, Mer Medicare or medicine, Medicare for all, like, um, but I really think it has something to do with our our values as a society, at least in modern America, and how, how we view the role of the family. Um, and I mean, when you look at other countries, for example, going back to Dr. Blake, FLMA is, or maternal or paternal leave is a huge deal. I mean, a year, in some places, even two years, which is ridiculous, right? If, if someone were to say, hey, I'd like to stay at home with my child and get paid for two years, it, it just wouldn't happen. Um, and the United States of America. And if, I think that may be a small part of it, but the, the larger problem is I think that we just don't cherish the idea of family as well and we don't support them well. And, and there's multiple ways. I mean, I don't know what social programs they have in other countries, but if you think about it, the number of social programs that the government introduces has just increased over time, right? And part of that is that they're trying to compensate for the lack of everything else that's going on with society. It's like well, we have parenting programs. Why are there parenting programs? They weren't there 20 years ago. So, or maybe there were, I don't know. But it's because people don't know how to be parents. And so we've tried to compensate for a lack of thing, something that's lacking within us. And the government's trying to compensate for that. But as I said, the government's not a substitute for the family or the village. Other comments or questions for Dr. Vo? So Richard, um, I want to congratulate you on a really excellent presentation um, that you prepared and shared with us today. Uh, it's very thought-provoking and, and a very serious topic. Uh, so I thought I would lighten the mood a little bit <laughs> <laughs> and tell you a little story. Um, when my daughter was um, in preschool, uh, I discovered that they had something called family-style meals. Uh, where they would sit all the children around the table and share the food. And for a uh, pediatric infectious disease specialist, that was a nightmare. Um, but um, <clears throat> irrespective of that, I think some of the points you've made are excellent in terms of what society's role is, what family's role is, what physicians and uh, physician advocates' role is in combating uh, what is clearly a crisis. Um, it's it's um, something that I think all of us need to think about what we are going to do to have an impact uh, on this problem. So thank you again very, very much, and thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you.